Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. So how do we appreciate this? How do we um, explain this? How to uh, visualize this restraint or constraint? Let us now consider uh, a bicrystal uh, A and B. There are only two crystals joined together. And this is the coordinate of this uh, diagram. And then this bicrystal is being subjected to tensile loading. Tensile deformation of a bicrystal. So the crystals A and B are of same material but oriented differently with respect to tensile axis. So let us assume this. Dilational and shear strains must be matched along the interface. That is X is a plane between the crystals. So we were talking about grain boundary uh, displacement uh, match right so we are now considering this a uh, bicrystal so this plane this this plane x is that right x is that plane is an interface so here dilational and shear strains must be matched so how do we visualize this this constraint increases the flow stress of a bicrystal in comparison to that of the single crystal okay so that is quite obvious right if, if the single crystal is being deformed, then this constraint, the additional constraint would not have arised. Each crystal can be considered to have a six strain components. Three tensile, that is epsilon x, epsilon y and epsilon z and three shear, gamma xy, gamma xz, gamma yz components. So we understand all this uh, a shear component, strain component, we have sufficient background for that, right? So with the coordinates of the schematic of bicrystal, the following conditions must be satisfied at the grain boundary in order to provide material continuity across it. So what are those conditions? The epsilon x of A should be equal to x, epsilon x of B. Epsilon z of A must be equal to epsilon z of B. And then gamma xz of A should be equal to gamma xz of B. So that is the compatibility condition. Where the superscripts A and B designate the individual crystals of the bicrystal. What is the problem here now? Since one grain has a higher value of cos phi and cos lambda. What is this? This is nothing but a Smith factor, right? Then the other, the constraints described by the above equation to restrict the deformation of this more favorably oriented grain and results in a higher yield stress and a greater outfarding response of the bicrystal. So it is now very clear now, this even though it is just two crystals uh, joined together, their orientation with respect to the tensile axis, which is given by a parameter, Smith factor, whichever the grain will have higher Smith factor will undergo the slip first as compared to the, the other. So that is going to cause more strain right or more stress higher yield stress to sustain the plastic deformation okay or it will exhibit a greater work hardening response okay so this is one uh, nice example to appreciate what is this grain boundary constraint so in a polycrystalline aggregate the grain boundary constraints are more restrictive than those for a bicrystal and thus the level of stress strain curve for a polycrystal is correspondingly higher. So now we expect uh, what kind of stress strain response for a single crystal and polycrystal. So we, we will just go through some couple of examples. The room temperature uh, tensile stress strain curves for a single crystal, bicrystal and polycrystals of niobium and sodium chloride is shown here. 
So it's a very nice uh, illust I mean, experimental uh, results or illustrations. What we see here is uh, the niobium single crystal and uh, niobium bicrystals and uh, polycrystal. And uh, what you observe is the bicrystal exhibits uh, much uh, higher strength, but the polycrystal uh, exhibits significantly higher uh, stress strain response. Okay. And of course, you see that uh, the strength goes up, the, 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 the strain values comes down. Those are all different idea. But then the here the focus is on the high flow stress arises from the compatibility issues or grain boundary constraints in the polycrystalline. That is the focus here. So it clearly shows that uh, that idea. Even in the you know brittle material, uh, this is uh, metal and this is. Uh, a kind of you know, ionic solid. So it also clearly shows that a single crystal strain curve, though there is no uh, significant uh, work hardening or something, but uh, if you look at the polycrystal, the, the flow stress is uh, quite steep here okay, as compared to single crystal and bicrystal. So that is the illustration here. So the level of flow stress of a bicrystal depends on the relative misorientation of the two crystals. This is very nicely demonstrated. So each grain in a polycrystal has three shear and tensile components of strain as described above for a bicrystal. However, out of these six, only five of these are independent because the dilational strains are related through the constant volume condition. What is that? That is epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z is equal to zero of the plastic deformation. Okay. Plastic deformation is a constant volume, uh, results in a constant volume. So this there is a, a condition there. So because of this, though we see the six components, and there, out of six, only five of them are independent. It can be shown that five independent slip systems are required to meet the boundary compatibility requirements. These arise from the five independent component of the strain. So now we are bringing uh, another uh, terminology or uh, I, I would say a fundamental requirement for a plastic flow. Okay, five independent slip systems are required to meet boundary compatibility requirements. How do we understand this? That is matching of displacement across the boundary, boundary necessitates the operation of five independent slip systems at least in the vicinity of the grain boundaries in each crystal of the aggregate. Very important. So in order to you know, proceed with the deformation without creating a void or cracks, uh, the, the matching of displacement across the boundary is necessary. And in order to do that, at least five independent slip systems in the each grain, at least in the vicinity of the grain boundaries are must. That is the idea. Otherwise, the plastic deformation will proceed with some defects. So now we will concentrate on the term independent slip systems. What is independent slip systems? Okay. The number of independent slip systems related to but not equal to the number of geometrical slip systems. Okay. So when we say that you know six uh, components, three tensile, three shear, they are all 
geometrical slip systems, but they are not necessarily of the independent slip systems. That is valid for all the crystal systems. We can just uh, take some examples and we'll see. To understand this, we let us proceed. An independent slip system is one for which slip displacements on it cannot be duplicated by a combination of displacements on other slip systems. How do we understand this? We will take some example. The concept can be illustrated by considering a basal slip in a hexagonal closed pack structure. So let us take this hexagonal closed pack structures where three geometrically distinct slip systems, okay, the three non-parallel closed pack directions, A1 bar, A2 bar, and A3 bar within the basal plane structure. So these three geometrically distinct slip systems are taken. However, an arbitrary displacement in the positive A3 bar direction can be duplicated by a combination of equal slip in the negative A1 and A2 directions. So what does it mean? Suppose if I travel uh, from this point center along this A3 vector okay by two units one two I'm I'm traveling this and then this is my end point I can also arrive at this point by traveling the negative you know directions of A2 and A1 how do I do that so if I choose to travel from this end and this direction is negative of A1. So 1, 2, I am reaching here. If I use A2, that is this, and this direction is negative. So from here, I will go 1, 2. So I come here. Okay. See, see this, is, this is what it is shown. Okay. It cannot be. Now I am duplicating A3 by combination of A1 and A2. So this is, this, this is not. Uh, considered independent. Thus, the number of independent slip systems for hexagonal basal plane slip is 2 and not 3. Okay, so this is uh, it's a nice example to understand this. The higher flow stresses of polycrystals are also due to geometrical consideration relating to the differing orientations of the individual crystals of aggregate with respect to tensile axis. Each crystal has its own characteristic value of split factor and those with the lowest tend to deform last in a tensile test. The highest will deform first, the lowest will deform the last. That is split factor. Okay, this is one uh, straight uh, forward thumb rule. Okay, so it is reasonable that the tensile yield strength sigma y relates to tau CRSS by geometrical relations existing between tau and sigma, and uh, thus in the analogy of the above equation. Uh, we can write sigma y is equal to m bar tau CRSS. Okay, the, the equation which is uh, considered here is the uh, Schmidt's law, where m bar is a suitable average for the polycrystal. Okay. Many of the dislocations accumulated during plastic flow result from the multiplication process. Since the dislocation encounter, since the dislocation encounters leading to multipli multiplication or chance encounters, the dislocation accumulated by such process are called statistically stored dislocations. So now we are now classifying the kind of dislocation which get generated during plastic deformation, right? Okay, before even I go to this uh, 
description. Uh, I just want to add a few more points to this uh, uh, factor idea. So we say that the highest the, uh, slip system or the grains in a polycrystal, the grain which exhibits uh, highest uh, slip factor, that means that grain is most favorably oriented for this slip. That's, that is a physical name. But that is not alone the factor, right? Uh, how the, you know, the other grains are going to uh, facilitate. For example, you assume that uh, a highest smith factor grain starts deforming first in a polycrystalline uh, microstructure. And as the deformation proceeds, you, there is no guarantee that the grain which started deforming in the first will continue to deform till the end in the same manner at least the same rate or I would say that this, the accumulation of the strain inside that individual grain it's not going to be the same rate till the fracture or till end of this plastic formation. So what is that I am trying to say? Though we say that this the grain which has the highest smith factor will start yielding first but as the deformation proceeds you don't know what will happen to that grain. Some other grain may start uh, deforming much faster than this grain as the deformation proceeds. Okay, so it is uh, it is not just uh, a characteristic smith factor alone uh, is going to decide the the strain accumulation across the gauge length. It is a characteristic geometrical constraint each grain experiences during plastic deformation that decides the uh, overall strain accumulation across the gauge length. So this is one point you, have, you can remember, very important point. So because such a, a close uh, observations are in terms of strain measurements are all just being done now and then there are evidences that these kind of uh, deformation behavior is happening. So it is not just smith factor, there are some other factors. At least I would consider to call them as um, characteristic geometrical constraints during the plastic deformation. Okay. okay. Now we move on to this uh, classification of dislocation. What are we saying here? As the deformation proceeds, the dislocation density uh, multiplies. So that means uh, the dislocation, dislocation interaction also the probability of uh, the dislocation interacting with the other dislocation is also increasing. So this is uh, this is by chance. That means when the dislocation is meeting the other dislocation so frequently because the dislocation density is high. So this uh, by the by that process it is also multiplying. So it is such by chance it is uh, getting generated. Okay, okay. That is why it is called statistically stored dislocation. Some plastic deformation is accompanied by a internal plastic strain gradients. Okay. Suppose if the plastic deformation also accompanies or just generates a strain gradient inside the material, then what type of dislocation it will generate? When such as gradients are present, geometrically necessary dislocations are accumulated in addition to the statistically formed ones. So this is very interesting. You have to pay a little more attention to get, grasp this idea. Okay. So you can ask uh, how this, uh, you know, uh, strain gradients are not created uh, in the general plastic deformation. That is not the question. The question is why uh, dislocations are, how the dislocations are generated. That is the question, right? So we will see some one nice way of illustration. Suppose you take this uh, a single crystal of this dimension, measuring uh, uh, length L and uh, thickness T, and it is being subjected to plastic bending like this. Okay, this is what this uh, 
described here, the plastic bending of the bar of length L and thickness T to a radius of curvature R. This is the radius of curvature R. Produces a tensile strain on the outer and the compressive strain on the inner bar surface. So it is, uh, since it's a bar, so inside it is uh, creating a compressive strain and the outer it is a tensile strain. What are the other quantities we can look at it? So since it is uh, the length is extended to L from L from L plus delta L and here the length is contracted from L to L minus delta L. That means there are greater number of atomic planes that is L plus delta L by B where B is interatomic spacing. So, so this is theoretically possible, right? When the length is increasing, that means uh, you can greater number of atomic planes on the outer surface than in the inner surface, which is nothing but L minus delta L by B. This strain gradient is accommodated by introduction of two delta L by B geometrically necessary dislocation into the crystal. So that is what shown here. Suppose the increase in the length of the outer surface and the decrease in the you know, length of inner surface that can be accommodated by introduction of the edge dislocation of, I mean, similar sign here. So, so this kind of extension of uh, the length is possible by introducing the dislocation like this on the several planes in the crystal. So we will look at it a uh, little more closely. How do we understand this? On bending the bar to a radius of curvature r, the upper portion of the crystal undergoes tensile deformation. That is, its length is increased from L, which is also r theta. You can look at this diagram. It is easy to understand to L plus delta L, which is also R plus T by 2 times theta. You see that this is a T and we are saying that uh, we are dividing this upper and inner. So it is T by 2 with the delta L being the positive and it has got the magnitude of T theta by 2. So de delta L has the magnitude of T theta by 2. Conversely, the inner, inner sur circumference uh, undergoes com compression with a negative length change of t theta by 2. This is positive change, this is negative change. Okay. Thus, a strain gradient accompanies the bending and the magnitude of the strain gradient is the strain difference between the two surfaces. So, let us understand this. So, strain difference is 1 plus uh, delta L minus 1 minus delta L. So that will become, uh, you know, 2 delta L divided by L is the strain. And this is a difference. Okay. This is a difference in the uh, two surfaces. And divided by the distance over which the gradient exists, that is the gradient exists from the inner surface to the outer surface, that is T, thickness is T. Okay, so we are calculating not just difference, but we are calculating the strain gradient. So the strain gradient is simply, you can visualize this, 2 delta L divided by LT, which is equal to theta by L. Because you substitute this uh, T theta by 2 here, so then you get theta by L, which is nothing but inverse of R. So we are defining this R theta, so it is inverse of R. So strain gradient is inverse of R. So what do you mean by this? What is strain gradient? The rate of change of strain within the volume of the uh, plastic deformation. The, the, the volume and over which the plastic deformation takes place where the, the rate of change of strain is happening this way. 
so that is that is how you have to understand the strain gradient okay so now the number of crystal planes on the tension surface is the sur surface length divided by the inter atomic spacing b b is also the burgers vectors magnitude sometimes okay we can take that take it like that likewise the number of atomic planes on the compressed surface is l minus delta r by b the difference in the number of atomic planes between the surfaces is accommodated by introduction of edge dislocation so you just just understand extra half planes you are introducing all over the place in the outer surface obviously you know the the length will increase right so this kind of dislocations okay are called geometrically necessary dislocations okay see this this illustration very nicely fit to the context okay so uh, to keep up the geometry to the additional length we are introducing the dislocation into the crystal system so that is why it is called the geometrically necessary dislocations their number is 2 delta l by b and their density rho g is the number divided by the crystal surface lt okay so crystal surface is lt because the length l and the width t hence rho g is equal to 2 delta l by lbt which is nothing but inverse of rb we can also relate that uh, equal to strain gradient by b okay please very important point here note that if there were no strain gradient no geometrical dislocations would be present that is quite obvious right if there is no strain gradient we would not have introduced an you know edge dislocation on the top surface if, if it's a perfect circle i mean a perfect strip of a single crystal there is no strain gradient and the strain gradient we have produced by bending it okay and then doing that we had to and introduce an additional dislocation to accommodate this bending plastic deformation right so this is nicely uh, conceived idea to uh, understand this concept moreover we emphasize that geometrical uh, dislocations present are in addition to those stored statistically so that the total dislocation density is rho s plus rho g So the precise density of uh, GNDs depends on the orientation of the slip plane and the direction with respect to the bending axis. Okay. So this is another important idea about this uh, GNDs. Uh, let us look at that. What is that? The figure illustrates a situation where the bending can be accomplished without the introduction of GNDs. See, previously we said that additional edge dislocations are inserted to accommodate the plastic deformation that is how the length of the outer surface got increased from l to l plus delta l but now we are seeing we can also do this without introducing gnds how do we understand this the single crystal shown here can be bent without the need of introducing geometric dislocation into it this is because the slip direction is normal to the axis of bending and the slip plane normal is parallel to the parallel to this axis so so what is this axis the axis is this this is the axis through which we are bending see the this is the slip direction and the normal to the slip plane are also parallel to this and uh, slip direction is perpendicular to, to this axis and that is why uh, the each slip plane is you know you can see that each one is a glide plane so it simply glides and then it produces the uh, slip over and there is no gradient okay thus the change in shape is accompanied solely by a dislocation motion and no plastic strain gradient exists between these sample surfaces okay so that is why it is important to understand that GND density 
depends upon the orientation of the slip plane and direction with respect to the bending axis or any plastic deformation orientation. Ordinary dislocation glide accommodates the shape change for this situation. Thus, for a general case, the geometrically necessary dislocation density is expressed as rho g is equal to alpha into strain gradient by b, where alpha is a constant of order unity. Okay, so this is one um, way of understanding this strain gradient. How this concept is useful in a general case, in a, a polycrystalline deformation, how, how this concept is useful. So if you look at this uh, schematic here, the image uh, is a polycrystalline uh, microstructure which is being uh, subjected to tensile deformation. The average uh, a grain diameter is D and um, what is shown here is uh, you can see that uh, as the deformation proceeds uh, you are able to see that the creation of voids and then overlaps uh, of these grain to the other. This situation shown here is is uh, you know completely un constrained deformation okay so that's what we are saying here an alternative way of viewing the constraints that individual crystals place on each other during polycrystalline deformation is provided in this four figures the figure shows that geometrically necessary dislocations can provide compatibility of displacements between adjacent grains okay so what happens is this is without a uh, uh, constraint. I mean, it, it produces the uh, uh, voids and uh, overlap. And what can be done here is to avoid this void. Instead of a void, it can be a, a dislocation spread on the interface. Instead of overlap, it could be a dislocation distribution between them, just to accommodate that kind of constraints. Okay, that's what it's uh, showing. Figure also shows uh, the deformation uh, that each grain would experience in the absence of constraints. That is the strain it would undergo if it deformed as a single crystal. Okay, that's what's shown here. Without constraint, voids and uh, I mean would ensue, and this does not happen in a reality. So. All these voids and uh, overlaps are nicely accommodated through uh, generation of geometrically necessary dislocations. And uh, whatever the, the ideas we have, uh, have seen, it, it nicely supports this uh, concept. And uh, in addition to the previously discussed aspects of multiple slip, voids and overlaps among the grains can be eliminated by geometrically necessary dislocation that accommodate the strain gradients that exist between the individual grains. And the dislocation arrangements required to produce compatibility are illustrated in this figure. So what you see here is uh, uh, we have brought this uh, concept of GNDs and also we have now shown how in a polycrystalline deformation, how it accommodates the strain gradient and uh, allow the deformations to proceed without forming the voids or overlap and other defects and so on. Okay. Okay. We will stop here and we will continue our uh, discussion in the next lecture. Thank you.